and let's give our attention to the reading of God's Word in Ephesians chapter 5. Let's begin in verse 21, and let's read to verse 29 and 30. Paul continues, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of His body. That is God's Word to us. You may be seated, and let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Father, we need Your help in marriage, in parenting, in our families, in our homes. These are one of the favorite targets of darkness. And while the culture is filled with lies and deception, we know you are a God of truth and you've given us the truth. We recognize here and now corporately that your way is best. Help me to preach to my brothers and my sisters here with clarity, with accuracy, with conviction, and with love. Help me to be a faithful servant to them that they might feast on your word and your truth today, and that would then impact the way we live our lives today, tomorrow, and onward. Keep us both aware of the threats that come, but also confident in the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Harvard University sociologist and historian Carl Zimmerman was not a prophet in the biblical sense, but he was in a way prophetic when in the 20s and 30s and 40s, he became widely known for his work in sociology regarding the family, and particularly what happens to the family in empires or civilizations that are falling, that are crumbling, and that are entering stages of demise. In 1947, he wrote a book called Family and Civilization, where he recorded his observations, and he compared the demise of various cultures with the parallel decline of the family. Eight specific patterns of domestic behavior were very consistent in societies and empires that were in a downward spiral. Here they are. Number one, marriage loses its sacredness and is frequently broken by divorce. Number two, the traditional meaning of the marriage ceremony is lost. Number three, feminist movements abound. Number four, there will be an increased public disrespect for parents and authority in general. Number five, There will be an acceleration of juvenile delinquency, promiscuity, and rebellion. Number six, there'll be a refusal of people with traditional marriages to accept family responsibilities. Number seven, there will be a growing desire and acceptance of adultery. And number eight, there will be an increasing interest and spread of sexual perversions and sex-related crimes. Zimmerman was no prophet, but he predicted exactly what we are living in today. This is our society. If you take a snapshot of the last 60 years, which is long enough to be born, married, have children, 
and now have grandchildren, you will have seen over 60 million babies murdered through abortion. As society says, they're just a clump of cells. They're not a beautiful heritage from the Lord. You will have seen the rise of feminism tell women that motherhood will only hinder their career dreams and ruin their body. You will have seen the sexual revolution and no-fault divorce in the 70s and into the 80s in which men begin to treat marriage like we lease cars, just trading in new models every three years. The school system under assault as children are poisoned with twisted narratives about their gender identity and their value. Today, there are groups lobbying to make pedophilia acceptable and normal. You know this. You see it in the news cycle. There are those who simply say, well, I identify as an eight-year-old girl, though I am a 52-year-old man with a beard. That is how I feel inside. You cannot tell me how I am to feel. I'm a little girl trapped in a large bearded man's body. It would be funny if it wasn't so disgusting. This is the world you and I are getting married in, raising children in, and stewarding grandchildren in. There are certainly as well issues within the church as some Christians seem more concerned with being accepted by the culture than preaching Christ in it. In New York, drag queens dominate story hour at public libraries and in schools, but we're seeing that now spread across the nation as well. Just this last year, one nonprofit I researched, formerly called Drag Queen Story Hour NYC, raked in $207,000 in taxpayer dollars, might I add, for their contracted performances in schools with children attending as young as three years old. In the number $207,000, 50,000 of that was given by the New York State Department through its Council on the Arts, but $157,000 of that amount came from the city's Departments of Education, Cultural Affairs, Youth and Community Development, and even the Department of Transportation threw in some coin to make sure the kids could come to the Drag Queen Story Hour. Why do I tell you that? To help you see and be reminded the culture is not neutral, is it? The school system is not neutral, is it? Government is not neutral, is it? It's not conspiracy theory on YouTube channels at 2 a.m. in the morning as you're down the rabbit hole. This is the truth and the reality that you and I now live in as Christians. This is no longer one nation, quote, under God. You are, as a professing Christian, in a nation that is most likely under God's judgment. That is the time we're living in. Sexual perversion and the assault on God's design is further assaulted by apps like Tinder, which boasts some 530 million users as people use platforms like this to engage in casual sex. Pair that with what Pew Research Center found, that 95% of teens have smartphones and 45% of those in one of their polls admitted they use their phones regularly for private interactions and romantic relations, which means we are as a society dating, flirting, getting married, having babies, and establishing households in a world where the education on these key spheres of the family has come from hookup apps, Snapchat, TikTok, and Instagram. We are in a sexual revolution on steroids. But that's the world out there. Surely, some of the most popular teachers in pop culture evangelicalism are taking a clear stand. Surely, I'm just over-exaggerating the impact by using worldly statistics. Surely not. Recently, Andy Stanley said that LGBTQ people just have an illness. While Michael Todd, who has replaced Stephen Furtick as the most popular preacher that your 
teenagers and our college students and young adults are listening to muddied the water on a biblical view of gender and sexuality, saying in his pulpit, and I quote, Oh God, the pastors don't say this because they want to be absolute. He was speaking about homosexuality and gay marriage. Well, well, why did, and then he stops, and he's referring then to, to male and female. He wasn't finishing his sentences. He never does because he's got an incredible gift of communication. He knows how to bring the crowd along. He looks like LeBron James in the pulpit. He rolls up to his church in a limited edition Tesla that's done up to the nines. He dresses like a baller, and young people go, wow, he's influential. I should listen to him, and he's a real charismatic speaker. So on, on the choices for gender and trans people, he says, well, well why did... I don't, and then he says, freaking no, in the pulpit. No, honestly, he says, I wish God would have made it so much simpler, and it was like A, B, C, or D, referring to which gender you might choose. And then he says, and I will only quote this in the pulpit, so that you are aware, because so many people are blind, and about four pastors this last month blasted me privately for bringing up Michael Todd in our pulpit and online because they think he's a great influencer and our local churches, not far away in Tucson, not three states over, but right here here in Chandler and Tempe, right in the epicenter of where we do church, their young adults pastors and their youth leaders say, leave Michael Todd alone. He's awesomely influential and he's firing up our young people. Well, he says, like Frick, No, I'm serious. As a pastor, it's like, what do you think about gay marriage? And I quote, I don't know. Shades of Joel Osteen on Larry King. I don't know. Shades of Carl Lentz, who Michael Todd just hired after his adultery issues at Hillsong when he was on The View in October of 2017, asked about abortion, and he says, you know, who am I to say what's sin? I don't know. I need to know their story. No, you need to know the Bible. Friends, it's not the world, the boogeyman out there. Oh, no, stay out of public schools. No, it's professing Christians. It's pastors in pulpits. It's local churches. And I'm not saying we're the only one, so come here and don't go anywhere else. We need an influx of new churches or new pastors who will stand for the truth in today's culture. But you know what else? If you would be weird enough and bold enough to marry Bear children, if the Lord would allow it, and steward your grandchildren in a way that God has commanded. Watch as it's not the preachers in the pulpit making the impact. It's you as God's people out there, salt and light everywhere used for His glory. That's what God wants. And the enemy continues to use the same strategy that we see in Genesis 3, 1 through 5, church. You know this didn't start with false teachers today and YouTube influencers. You know, it goes all the way back to the garden. Listen or look on the screen at Genesis 3, 1 through 5. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said? Many people think that the first lie in the Bible was in a few verses when he says, surely you won't die. It wasn't. The first lie in the Bible was when he presented God's information in a twisted way. Look what he says. Indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. The devil knew what he was doing. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or surely you will die. And verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The devil has been viciously undermining God's truth and God's design since the beginning. So you know what's exciting? That in the midst of a crazy world, and in the midst of false teachers and influential Bible-twisting preachers, you don't need to worry. You got the truth. You need to focus on the truth. You need to embrace God's design. You need to stick to God's design. You need to be aware of things going on around you, but ultimately, if you stick to the truth, you are going to be just fine. 
What works? God's design. What never changes? God's design. What do you go back to when you fail and miss the mark? Because y'all will, we will, everybody does. God's design. What is the solution to the lies that the devil spews on marriage, identity, sexuality, parenting, and the like? God's design. And so we begin there because if you want a strong marriage and a strong home, you cannot have these without the right foundation. The most pivotal moment in our our series or our time in these weeks ahead on these subjects is this sermon because before God will change a wife, and I know some of you husbands can't wait for next week because she's not very submissive. Just hold your horses. And before God changes a husband, I know some of you ladies are the Holy Spirit every week, throwing elbows into his ribs. Told you, hold your horses. Before God changes your children and your home, you know what he does? He changes hearts. That's where we begin here and now. There's three questions that are going to lead us to reflect and ultimately discover the not-so-secret to success when it comes to marriage and family. What I would just say is how to lay the right foundation. These aren't guarantees that you'll be perfect. They're just guarantees that you follow a perfect God who gave you a blueprint to follow. The first is, how do I view self? How do I view self? The second, how do I view others? The third, how do I view Christ? We begin with how do I view self. Paul says in verse 21, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Let's just focus on those three words and be subject. This is where we ask the question, how do I view self? Why? Well, because we're talking about the submission or the subordination of self. The word here used is the Greek word hupotasso. It means to bring oneself under someone or something else. And so, there's this idea of becoming a willing servant ranked under someone else. The idea here simply being Christians are called to be submissive people in the right ways for the right reasons, and this requires a right view of self that comes from the Bible and not from the world. In Ephesus, where these Christians lived, the idea that you would submit yourself to anyone or anything was entirely foreign. They didn't just loathe humility, they celebrated pride and the ego. This was their normal cultural pattern. Pride, individualism, and self-glorification were at the center of their lifestyles. Rebellion and self-glorified or self-centered behavior was expected. And so before Paul can give instructions for their relationships, and before you and I are ready to hear wives submit to your own husbands or husband love your wives, we first need to deal with our own hearts and be dealt with in that regard. Being subject is entirely Christian. We, as believers, subject ourselves to qualified and godly leaders in our churches. That's Hebrews 13, 17, in which people are to submit to their leaders who care for their souls, and those leaders will answer to Christ for how they cared for souls. No self in the body of Christ is outside some scope of authority. Peter, when he's addressing Christians who are being persecuted by evil governing authorities, says to them that they are to be submissive to governing authorities. And then he describes the way government is supposed to work as those who punish evildoers, right? And yet still in the midst of persecution, the Christian is supposed to stand firm in their faith and be generally regarded as not rioters and looters, but faithful servants of Christ, even unto death. However, understand that the idea of submission to qualified godly leaders is good, and the idea of being generally godly, submissive citizens is good. However, we are also called to be submissive to our God. So when government says that we are to do things that is sinful, we then do not submit to government. We submit to God. Do you see how submission is a part of the Christian life in every single situation? The question is simply, Who am I supposed to submit to in this situation, and how am I supposed to submit to them? But submission is part of our life. No one is self-made. 
No one is the man or the woman or the center of it all. Even the husband who is the head over the wife and may preside over his home in this regard. And you see that picture and think, wow, well, who does he answer to? Well, the Bible says very clearly, and we'll get to this in two weeks, that Christ is the head of every man. And so even still operating in headship, the man submits to Christ. Submission is Christian. And so, will you view self the way the world does or the way God does? Will you view your role in all of this according to God's pattern or the pattern of this world? Will you define marriage and the family the way the world does or the way God does? The world will say that self is the priority. God's Word says self is the problem. And I want to show you this. If you'll turn to James 4 verse 1, I will show you the root of every one of your marriage problems and your relationship problems in this passage. This is one, if you've never interacted before, you may want to bookmark or dog ear or highlight your Bible. And if you don't know where to find it, keep moving to the right. And if you get to Hebrews, go one more book. And if you're brand new to the Christian faith, you can follow along on the screen, and we'll have it there as well. James 4, verse 1. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is it not the source, is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? He's saying, oh, you got all these things inside you want, all this prideful ambition. You lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and you can't obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? He essentially says, you cheaters in your relationship with God. You are committing the sin of infidelity. You love the world, not him. And then he finishes saying, therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Do you see the root issue there? A worldly love of self will lead to problems in all of your relationships, more than just problems, hostility and conflict, because that's what pride does. And furthermore, it's not the way the Christian home was designed to operate, and so you're naturally not going to see God's blessing on a home that operates in this regard. Why would you? God's not in that plan. And so, to the husband that may say, well, if my wife would just do what I want, I'll be nicer to her, you are acting in that moment as an enemy of God. Or to the wife who may say, well, if he'd make enough money to give me the life I dreamed of, or if he was in better shape, or if he acted like that guy or this guy or did this for me, I'd give him more of what he wants, or I would, I would love him more. You are acting like an enemy of God and a friend of the world. The Christian does not fight for self, but rather we fight to lay ourselves down. And the reason it's a dogfight is how many of you know your flesh is very strong. You want what you want, when you want it, how you want it. That's why we would say biblically that we are to kill the flesh or crucify the flesh along with its passions. Why does the Bible use such a term if the word crucify is synonymous with Christ on a cross? Because you and I are meant to kill that attitude. It is aggressive. That's why many times confessing it to the Lord and also to someone you trust is so key because you're just not going to leave it in the closet. It can't stay in the dark where it can survive. You bring it out into the light, and what does the Holy Spirit do when He's in us and we're walking according to God's design and plan in our homes, marriages, family, even in the church with our relationship? He will heal and restore that so quickly. You think, man, I'm glad I didn't tell a lot of people because it was here on Friday and it was done on Sunday. Praise God. That's why, by the way, a little marriage advice before we get there, don't tell your in-laws about every fight. You forgive two hours later and are on date night. But your mama didn't forgive or forget. 
Love covers a multitude of sin. Thank God for the word multitude. Tells you what to expect. We lay ourselves down. And ultimately, this is what Christ did in Philippians 2. Paul says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Do nothing. That means every action, every word. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Have this attitude in verse 5, in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taken on the form of a bondservant. He's made in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus, the Son of God, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Like Jesus laid himself down for a greater purpose, you as his disciples, me as his disciple, are called to lay ourselves down for a greater purpose. You cannot experience God's blessing in your marriage if you will not bow your will to God's will. So how do you view self? Number two, how do I view others? Keep tracking with me in verse 21, back in Ephesians 5 and be subject to one another. Three more very important words. One another. It's referring to other believers here, for sure, we know that, but also setting the stage for the one another's in some of the most important and intimate relationships you and I are going to have in marriage and in our homes. This is to want the best for others, to seek the good of others, to come alongside and, and, and come underneath to uplift others. Now, if you're a a logical thinking person, I go through this in my study each week where I'm asking questions of the text. One of the first things I ask when I really meditate on verse 21, and this in particular, is if everybody's submitting to each other, then who is in authority? Think about this for a moment. In a minivan full of children, who are hungry. Ask them what they want for dinner. You have immediately a wide menu of responses. And they sound much like the church at Corinth. I am of Chick-fil-A. I am of In-N-Out. But then there's the response, and I love you sisters very much, but statistically this is true. The answer, I don't know. And so as a husband, being diplomatic and a godly wise leader, we begin to list a lot of restaurants to which our blessed brides and many times their own offspring, usually the daughters who are like the mothers, (laughs) say also, yeah, I don't know, none of those. And then inevitably the husband then says what? Okay, thank you. Now that I know what you don't want, what do you want? I don't know what I want, but I can tell you what I don't want. And we wonder why we need a counseling department (laughs) in the church. You think about spheres of authority and and what this means and how it fits in. It is that in all of these relationships, there is a system or an order that God gives, and yet if all of us are primarily concerned not with ourselves but with others, then when we operate within those spheres of authority, we're going to be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Let me give you some examples. A father may be the head of his home, but he is subject to the requests and needs of his wife in line with Scripture. This is to be a leader who makes the right decisions 
for the good of others. It is not to be one who lets everybody shoot the dust and make you dance. It's not to be a pushover or a doormat, but rather a godly leader who makes the right decisions for others. A wife may have strong feelings or strong opinions. She may have strong thoughts or preferences, but if Scripture is not imposed, she may lay those down for others. You may have parents who are in authority over their children, but they choose to self-sacrifice for the spiritual benefit of those children. One father may think, I'll do what I want. I'm the man around here. I'm the head of this house. Where another says, as the head of this home, I need to make decisions that primarily bless my wife and children because while I am the leader, that does mean I am responsible and accountable. How can I best serve the needs of my family? You notice how the others-focused way of life sets the stage for blessed relationships. If I am most concerned about you and you are most concerned about me, how can you have any other outcome except unity? That's what you get in a family. That's what you get in the church. That's what you get in relationships. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 3 speaks to this attitude in the healthy nature of biblical intimacy. This is to be used the right way, and we'll talk more about this in the weeks ahead. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband, talking about intimacy relationships and marriages. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does, and likewise Also, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. That truth is not popular in today's world where everybody screams, my body, my choice, I'll do what I want. Biblically, a husband's body belongs to his wife, the wife's body to her husband, both laying themselves down with an others-focused mentality. So how do you view others in all of your relationships? Are they just a means to your end? Are they useful until they're no longer useful and then you punt them off to the side and choose to be with other people that will be more useful once again to you? Is it all about you? Your way is the highway? I'm telling you right now, I know this because God's Word paints this picture. If you are experiencing brokenness in your relationships, your family, your marriage, your parenting, Look no further than transactional love. If you do this, then I'll do this. That is a marriage killer. It is a home wrecker. Jesus calls us to a different way. How you view self, will you be submissive? How you view others, will you be a servant? And finally, third, how do I view Christ How do I view Christ? Look at the last five words of verse 21. In the fear of Christ. The Greek word phobos, where we get our word phobia, he's not talking about being scared of spiders or scorpions or snakes. He's talking about reverence and respect. A healthy fear of Christ is where this attitude comes from. So you are submissive and you serve others in your relationships, ultimately not because you want something from them, but because you want something for them, not because if you love them, they'll love you back, but because you love Christ. You fear and respect Him. This is why the biblical foundation for any healthy marriage is not two people that are super into each other, not two people super attracted to each other. Both of those are fine. You should like your spouse, and you should like looking at your spouse. But ultimately, it is two people who are head over heels in spiritual love for Jesus Christ. Then, and only then, with them running after Jesus and following Jesus, they catch eyes on their journey and say, I sure do like you. And they get one back because you have to have reciprocation. None of this, God told me you're my spouse. And she says, you didn't tell me. You go, that's okay. I'm the head of this home. I'll hear for both of us. You know, that's not how it works. <laughs> she says, I, I, I sure like you. 
says, I like the way you run after Christ. And she says, I like the way you run after Christ. And together they do that. You know why? Because one day it's going to be one of them. And if the relationship was built on the other person, that's when people lose faith, lose hope, lose perspective. Ultimately, their faith was just a sort of cherry on top in the midst of their sexually attracted, unbiblical foundation for the relationship. And so when you don't have them, you have nothing. And I understand all the sentiments. Oh, my wife is my heartbeat. Yes, I get the Valentine's Day cards and all that stuff. I'm all about it. Hopeless romantic, with you all the way. But in the end, my life, your life, is not over because our husband or our wife go into glory. That is heartbreaking. That is tragic. Life will never be the same, but ultimately your faith is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and His righteousness. You dare not trust in the sweetest frame, but you wholly trust in Jesus' name. That's why we say Christ alone. So those of you who are single still, you're not married yet, Christ alone as the foundation, then they come along. You're already going 75 on the freeway of faith, and they can keep up. They're going 40, sorry, love you, come to church, stay there, I'm in the HOV lane, I'm chasing Jesus, I'm gone. That's how it works. When one of you got to slow down, you're going to have an accident. Why? Because I'm doing all this in the fear of Christ. I want to please you because I love you, but ultimately I want to please Jesus, and out of that love for him, I'll love you better. Did you know that a lack of fear of the Lord is the mark of the wicked, not the righteous? Romans 3.18 says, the wicked have no fear of God. Whereas Proverbs 9.10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So you are wise if you will fear the Lord above all others. And how you view Christ determines everything in your marriage and in your family. And the fear of the Lord will bring God's blessing upon your home. It will. You may not always be the richest. You may not always be the most popular. You may not always have everything that you want. But if you have Christ, you'll have everything you need. You have the sure foundation and the anchor for your soul in the home. He is Christ. In Acts 9, Paul is converted. He goes all out for the gospel. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. He knew the law. He was the man around Judaism. And all of a sudden, he gets saved, and it's this radical conversion, and then he starts preaching Christ all over the place. And he's frustrating the Jews a great deal in Acts chapter 9. They're coming for him. He causes no small disturbance in the process of what Acts 9.22 describes as proving that Jesus was the Christ. There was much to fear as people opposed Christianity, much to fear as they were persecuted for their faith, much to fear by way of pleasing people who were now very upset with Paul and Christians. In the midst of all this, Verse 31 in Acts 9, one of my favorite passages, I think about this and pray this over our church all the time. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace being built up in the midst of a culture that hated them, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of darkness, they had peace, they were being built up. Yep. Why? Well, I think the key is in the rest of the verse. And going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. There is nothing more comforting for you, more confidence building for us as a body than to fear the Lord. You are in the right place, believing the right things, living the right way if you fear Christ over all else. This is how we grow properly. This is how churches grow healthy. Fear the Lord. People might say these messages and this method are outdated. Gender identity is just a social construct meant to trap people in bodies when really they are a woman, but they only appear to be a man. Or they are a man and they only appear to be a woman. Or that God just wants you to be happy. And so divorce is fine if you don't like her anymore. 
This is not God's way. These are all lies from the devil. His goal is to blind people with deception. And remember, his primary method is not to show up in your room at the foot of your bed with a pitchfork and a red tail and some horns saying, here I am to deceive you. I'm the devil. Good to meet you. No. He uses the subtlety of culture and its pull. He uses your emotions. He uses influence. He uses things that look good, feel good, and sound good. But most of all, he'll use a lack of the fear of the Lord. When you begin to worry more about what this world says than what your God says, it's time to go back to his design and his truth. How do you view Christ? Will you submit to Scripture or the opinions of the world? Think the not so secret to success here, to be fruitful and to be faithful in our marriages and homes, to lay the route foundation. Here's what we all need to say with our mouths and with our actions. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen.